Salvation by Langston Hughes is a fascinating and controversial uh, little piece that raises lots of issues about belief, about peer pressure, about how on earth do we behave when everybody wants us to do a certain thing and we are supposed to do a certain thing. So then we go ahead and we do that certain thing and what the results of that are. Of course, all of that being compounded by the fact that the thing that is in question isn't just you know, smoking a cigarette in the bathroom of high school or, you know, like saying something mean to somebody just because your friends want you to or something like that. It's the matter of religion itself. Langston Hughes is a fascinating person to have written this piece as well because he, of course, is one of the, you know, foremost and most important uh, members of the Harlem Renaissance, uh, which was a huge sort of... Uh, situation of black artistic awakening that took place in the mid 20th century and that's a really sort of fascinating thing uh, that uh, is attached to this piece and it also gives it a greater legitimacy the thing is is in salvation it says starts right off dives right in again one of those narratives that just dives right in i was saved from sin when i was going on 13 but not really saved right so it starts off by saying i was saved but not really you know, so right there in the first two sentences, we get this sort of like, you know, back and forth. We get this, uh, you know, what exactly is going on kind of thing that, that makes it interesting. Um, in this story, uh, he ends up sort of going to a revival. He's supposed to be getting saved. But then, unfortunately uh, for him, he was under the expectation that he was going to actually, like, see Jesus. And he kept waiting and waiting and waiting for that revelation to happen. Uh, and it, it just doesn't happen for him. Uh, some things that are interesting about the narration in this piece and how it's written, uh, for example, at the beginning of the second paragraph, it says, my aunt told me that when you were saved, you saw a light and something happened to you inside and Jesus came into your life and God was with you from then on. I love the use of exclamation points there. Uh, a lot of times exclamation points are not good. Most of the time, like 90% of the time people use them, especially in academic writing, they are the wrong idea. Uh, but here, it really works well because it demonstrates the enthusiasm with which people were expecting him to uh, embrace Jesus and for this thing to happen for him. So then when he goes, and it says, still I kept waiting to see Jesus, and one by one, all of the other little kids, every single one of them, they all go up, all the young teenagers, they all go up, they're all accepted, they're all saved, everybody's sobbing, everyone's crying, everyone's cheering and praying and like doing all of this and then he's just still sitting there waiting to see Jesus and it's not happening. Uh, Langston, why don't you come? Why don't you come and be saved? Oh, Lamb of God, why don't you come? Now it was getting really late. I began to be ashamed of myself holding everything up so long. I began to wonder what God thought about Wesley, who certainly hadn't seen Jesus either, but who was now soundly uh, who is now sitting proudly on the platform, you know, because his friend, of course, was just like, I haven't seen anything either, but he just got up and went up there, right? Uh, and it says, God had not struck Wesley dead for taking his name in vain or for lying in the temple, you know? So there's all this pressure. Everybody else has done it. Everybody else has done it, even though even his friend who he knows didn't actually see Jesus went along with it as well. And then he's just still waiting. So then, of course, at a certain point, he breaks, and he goes up, and he says that he believed. Uh, you can think whatever you want of Langston Hughes, of the narrator, in this particular situation. Um, was it his doubt that led him to not see, you know, is everybody just like Wesley, just faking it, or like Langston, ultimately, just faking it? Um, or is there such a thing as true belief? Uh, do some people truly believe and other people don't truly believe? I mean, all of those things are on the table, and that's what makes this such a fascinating uh, little story, is that it raises all of these questions for us to consider consider uh, as readers, as thinkers, as people, as like, you know, people who are interested in, you know, salvation or religion or people who aren't interested in those things, that for all of those circumstances, they're all sort of laid out on the table for us to think about. And then, of course, towards the end, we get the characterization. I feel like we should be, you know, showing a lot of understanding towards our narrator here because it says that night, for the last time in my life but one, for I was a big boy, 12 years old, I cried. I cried in bed alone and couldn't stop. 
right? I buried my head under the quilts, but my aunt heard me. She woke up and told my uncle I was crying because the Holy Ghost had come into my life and because I had seen Jesus. But I was really crying because I couldn't bear to tell her that I lied, that I had deceived everybody in the church, and I hadn't seen Jesus, and that now I didn't believe there was a Jesus anymore since he didn't come to help me. <sighs> wow, what an ending. What an ending. And that's just one of those things where in the margin of my book, I even wrote, what do we think now? Uh, what's the thing that we take away from this? Do we believe? Do we pity the narrator? Do we condemn the narrator? All of these things, all this interpretive possibility is on the table, and that's the power of the narration.